Hello, today's topic is raising multilingual children. That's the request I got last week, the uh, most common request, and it's something that I'm very qualified to speak on given that I have two sons, uh, Artashir, the older one is 15, of Aldemar, the younger one is 13. They've both been exposed to eight languages and they know seven of them. They know two languages fluently, three languages to an advanced level, one at a beginner's level, and uh, one is in some sort of fascinating, nebulous, hard to describe, complicated state that I'll talk more about later. Uh, and we have achieved all that without um, blood, sweat, and tears, without undue emphasis on language learning, no uh, obsessive focus on it like I myself did in my own language learning time, just in the course of growing up and uh, raising a family. So I'm happy to share my experience and my, uh, my, my knowledge about it that I've acquired. And uh, I'm probably about to launch into a lengthy lecture. And when I give lectures in front of a class or in an auditorium, I encourage questions along the road, but here obviously that can't happen, so I'm going to try to be as comprehensive as possible. I, I saw by the middle of the week that this would be the topic and I've been giving it a lot of thought, um, but it's impossible for me to anticipate things that will need clarification and further explanation, so maybe when I do a video like this, um, I should have uh, one week I'll, I'll do a lecture and then the next week I'll do a question and answer to the um, things that people want more information about. <coughs> okay, so... Um, in applied linguistics, there's two ways that people get uh, languages through acquisition and through learning. Acquisition being just uh, from the environment, learning being by study. So um, my sons have gotten their languages from a mixture of these and I will talk about them, uh, starting with the languages they've acquired. Um, their first native, their native, the first language, their, their native language is emphatically English. And when I first started thinking about this video, I thought I didn't need to say anything about it. But the more I, the more I thought about it, I realized the more I did because I know that uh, a lot of people, when they think about raising multilingual children, fear that um, some doing so will somehow damage or or delay or hinder their native language development. And I would just like to say that in, in our case, there was absolutely not at all. There was nothing at all like this, and no way, shape, or form has their English development been negatively impacted by learning all these other languages. Um, my, both my sons have always been very articulate, uh, well-read young men. Uh, any sort of standardized test that they take uh, of, of their um, level, you know, shows that their English is, is considerably above their, their age or grade level. Um, so I, I really don't think that this is something that one need fear. Uh, even though we've lived abroad in many different places, they don't speak some sort of hybrid uh, international English. They sound, you know, like little American boys. Um, they are very well read, like I said, uh, and I think that that is the crux of the matter. Because I do know, um, I encounter every day among my own students at the university here, people who uh, have their native language has suffered by all the emphasis has been put on getting their English up to what they need to study at an international university. And their English, they might sound very good, uh, but is not, you know, their vocabulary, their ability to express themselves is, is not at a native speaker's level. And likewise, uh, in many cases, they tell me that their their native language, they're, they're not all that skilled in it. So um, I think we've avoided that trap by A, the fact that in their schooling, in their curriculum, they've always um, done all the language arts type programs and so it's not just acquisition, it is you know a, a certain amount of actual training in, in writing. Uh, the curriculum that they're now following is very heavy on essay writing. They both write many essays each week and more than anything else, um, reading. Um, pleasure reading. Uh, you can see behind me I'm a, I'm a bookworm and it's just natural that my sons would pick that up and that's always been my favorite activity and theirs too. So um, I think that yes, I have uh, spent time on other languages with them that I would uh, inevitably have taken away from uh, their English development, but it hasn't hurt them in the slightest. Uh, if anything, I would say that knowing other languages has helped them because English has so many loan words in it that I think that their vocabulary has increased because of what they've done with other languages. <coughs> okay, so the uh, my sons are definitely multilingual, and I use the term multilingual to refer to acquired languages rather than studied languages or learned languages. But I don't know if they're really bilingual, trilingual, quadrilingual, or even quintilingual. So uh, I'll describe uh, in turn the other languages that they have acquired 
uh, that they have that they know largely or initially because of acquisition. And the other language that they are fluent in is uh, French. And it's not my native language, and my wife doesn't really speak it at all. So this may seem a little strange, but um, it is one of my better languages, and it's a language that I truly love. And I just wanted to share it with my sons when I had the opportunity to do that. It all started in Lebanon when uh, Ardashir went to a uh, a nursery school, a kindergarten, uh, put him deliberately, specifically put him in, in, in a French-speaking one so he would pick it up and uh, he just started speaking it and I spoke it with him and I have always done so. That's just sort of not a fanatical rule but um, that's just the case. When I'm alone with my sons, I always speak to them uh, in French. Uh, when Valdemar was born, his brother and his father did it, so uh, we just have always spoken it among ourselves. Um, apart from that, I would say that uh, this is also due to reading. Again, my m the main way of spending time as a father with my sons has always been reading books aloud to them. I started this when they were toddlers, and I continue that now uh, as they are teens. Um, and we just have always, you know, read books aloud. So um, that's the same factor of acquisition, but likewise, they have had a fair dose of, of learning um, French as well um, in both Singapore and Dubai. I think in every big international city, there is a French cultural center, une alliance française, where um, they offer classes not in French as a foreign language, but French for francophone kids who are not being schooled in, in a French language medium. And so my sons have taken the entire sequence of these courses, five or six years, uh, from as, as soon as they were eligible to do so until the highest level uh, that they offer. Uh, and I have always talked to the teachers there and have said, you know, please give them, you know, as much homework, as much writing as possible. So they have had that sort of language arts instruction uh, in, in French as well. Um, in particular in Singapore, uh, where they have uh, the schools that have a native language requirement, which is uh, either Chinese or, or Tamil or Malay, uh, and students who are, have another language can either get out of it or declare an, another native language. So I had French uh, declared for them, and so when students went to their language arts classes, my sons could go to the library and sit and read French and, <coughs> and do their homework there. So. Um, Again, uh, when, when we would go do these things, uh, it was always on Saturday, and we would just make Saturday our entire French Cultural Center Day. We'd go to their classes in the morning, and then we'd sit in the library and, until it closed in the evening and spend the entire day reading there. And I always encourage them to check books out and uh, read, uh, read books uh, all the time. So they're tremendous readers in French as well as in English. Um, these days, you know, they're past the level of these courses. I do encourage them to, you know, to, to read books in French as well as in English. If they've read one book in one language, I say, you know, if I notice they're only reading books in one language, I'll say, don't you want to read a book in, uh, in, in the other language? They like to read books in series and sometimes they like to stay for a while, but in general they alternate reading a, a novel in French and a novel in English. Um, apart from reading. They also do a lot of uh, writing, transcription. Uh, every morning they do, uh, I don't know if it's a chapter or a verse or a page of, of handwriting, copying from the French Bible into a, into a notebook that they're making their own uh, handwritten copy of it with. And then in the course of the day I encourage them to, there's a program where you can uh, learn how to type in the various keyboards and you can also put in a, a text that you're copying. So they put in a text from Jules Verne or something like that, a, a French novel, so they, uh, they type that, so they get a lot of transcription and writing. I encourage them to, to listen, watch movies, do things like that, but um, it's, it's more through writing and reading that they get their exposure and speaking with me. Um, so their brains are definitely, you know, functioning most of the day in English, but a good couple of hours each day uh, is in French as well. And if they're reading, you know, their main book is in French, they might spend many hours each day reading it. Um, so as a result, I mean, 
nobody would ever take them for little Parisians. Um, their weak point would definitely be their accent, because it's a copy of mine, which isn't perfect, and we just speak among ourselves. But um, none of their teachers ever said this. This was a problem. Uh, they, they, you know, they're perfectly comprehensible, and more importantly, their their structural knowledge and their vocabulary is quite rich. <coughs> so. Um, that's French. That's how, if you love a language, even if it's not your native language, you might succeed in, in getting your children to do it well. It really helped that it was a major language like French that has this cultural center in each city. Um, I don't know if you could do it with a lot of smaller languages, but languages like that, it's definitely a, a possible thing to do. So if that's one thing that we did right, uh, something we did wrong uh, in terms of getting our children to speak a language is the third language that they're definitely trilingual in is Korean. Um, given that their mother is a native speaker and their father is a, is a fluent foreign scholar of the language, it would be a logical thing to presume that they should be totally fluent in this language as well. But um, that's just not the way it worked out. Um, when I first met my wife, we, when we lived in Korea, um, we spoke exclusively Korean. Uh, and so for the first couple of years of Ardashir's life, and, and when Avaldemar was a toddler, that's probably all they heard us speaking. So they certainly had a, a childhood, an early infancy foundation in the language. But basically what happened was, is when we left Korea and went to Lebanon, and more specifically when we moved to the United States, my wife she needed English. And when I married her, she, she couldn't speak it. And so she just had to put all her energy into really mastering this language. And she wanted to switch her brain entirely into English. So she's sort of just, I don't know that she ever openly said, but she's defense the fact she didn't want to use Korean. She wanted to switch her brain into English and use English all the time. And so we just got into the habit of doing that. <coughs> Um, she will. Uh, she spoke Korean to the boys when they were toddlers, but I don't think she has really spoken it to them since. She and I speak it uh, when we're alone. I, I, I kind of switch to it and, and get her to, to stay in it. And we also speak it kind of as a a secret language when the boys are around and we don't want them to understand what we're saying. And if I had made this video uh, a year or two ago, I would have just left it at that and saying that, you know, they have a, a passive understanding. When we do that, they, they know what we're talking about. They can't follow the details. They don't know the specifics, but they say, oh, I know you're talking about this, this, this. And, and they're right. They, they can follow along with the, the general idea, but certainly not get the the important content, and they really couldn't speak it or, or write it or, or read it. Uh, again, another mistake, if you were, that uh, we made, my wife made. She never read books to them in Korean that I can remember. So they probably had kind of a, a much weaker foundation than that they really ought to have had. Um, but it was there. It's still there. <coughs> And as I said, things have started to change over the past couple of years uh, as my wife is sharing, watching videos uh, in Korea and with them um, of sort of comedy shows and, and dramas that have subtitles in English, but they're definitely all in Korean. And this has um, certainly helped their understanding and piqued their interest in, in the culture and the language. So uh, a couple of years back, uh, we started studying it. The boys and I started you know, learning it, you know, t teaching the alphabet and doing some exercises and the like. And um, it just so happens that in November, next month, they're going to go spend uh, three weeks uh, in Korea for the first time in many years. And they're very excited about going uh, to, you know, to, to be there. And so they've been making a real push at the language, putting more and more energy into studying it, doing it some on their own with things like Duolingo, uh, with me, with some grammar books and reading aloud, uh, speaking it to their mother a little bit more, saying, you know, little phrases here and there. Um, they don't know this yet. <laughs> Um, but uh, she and I were talking, we're going to try to make this an immersion experience for them. I'm, I'm not going, just they're going. They're going to be staying with their aunt and uncle and grandmother, none of whom speak a word of, of English. And uh, their cousins probably do and are going to want to use this opportunity to speak, but we're going to request that we try to make this a total immersion experience for them, sink or swim, and see if they can um, come out of this with uh, sort of activated language knowledge. Um, so maybe I'll have an update on this uh, 
towards the end of November, or maybe they'll I'll let them stay longer if it's working well. So this was the nebulous, cloudy language. I, I don't know how to describe their abilities in this language accurately. It's not what it should be, okay, but uh, it's not negligible. It's not nothing. <coughs> okay. The uh, fourth language uh, that they kind of acquired uh, was Spanish um, in that when we moved to the States when we, uh, Valdemar was two or she was four they went to nursery schools, preschools, kindergartens and started grade school there in dual immersion programs where um, they had Spanish and English side by side together and particularly in the in the in the kindergarten there were just lots of Spanish speaking families and kids. So Ardashir had this a little bit longer than Avaldemar, but Avaldemar had it, I think, a bit more intensely because his best friend was um, a boy from a Mexican family and he would spend time over at their place, so they heard it. So I remember that they both were, you know, getting going, getting a foundation in, in Spanish there as well, but when we moved to Singapore, um, that stopped. I mean, I was I was committed to doing French with them, and you know, I had my job. I didn't spend time. You know, we just couldn't continue with that. So, um, if we hadn't picked it up through studying, I would have thought maybe that was just gone and lost. I didn't have it, but we have picked it up through studying, and I think there's a lot of reasons, a lot of factors that it's been particularly easy for them to learn, and I think this is possibly one of them. <clears throat> okay. And then the fifth language, the languages that they uh, uh, learned or acquired uh, in early childhood uh, were, in Ardashir's case, Arabic at that same um, nursery school, a French-speaking nursery school. They're all Arabs and Lebanese, and so he had a pretty decent understanding of colloquial Lebanese Arabic when we were living there. Uh, and in Avaldemar's case, he went to the same age when we were in, um, in Singapore, and so he picked up some Chinese there. Um, but in both cases, I would say that this, whatever knowledge they had, is, uh, was, it was minimal. Uh, I mean, not minimal, but it wasn't very substantial, and now it's totally gone. So um, in terms of actual practical knowledge. I don't think they get anything from this, but in terms of, uh, I haven't read up on it all that much, but in terms of building multilingual minds and developing their, <clears throat> their brains to be good at, at, at learning languages, this may have had an impact uh, upon them as well. So uh, those are the languages that they learned largely um, by acquisition. Um, French and English had a amount of uh, formal structured learning as well, and as a result, they um, they're fluent in them. They read these languages all the time. Korean did not have uh, that background, and so um, they are very, very iffy in that. Um, Spanish, I'll get to again. Uh, well, I think what they know is not due to their exposure eight or ten years ago, but what we've been doing more recently. And uh, yeah, the other languages are gone. So. <coughs> Moving on to languages that they've learned, uh, these would be uh, German, Latin, Spanish, and Russian. Um, we started when we moved to Singapore, and I'm sorry, when we moved to Dubai, um, they were in a sort of structured home pro homeschooling uh, curriculum called K-12 International Academy that had a world language program made by Middlebury College specifically for younger children. Um, not an adult program at all, but you know, designed with children in mind. And so um, we started that, uh, so I guess that's six, seven years ago, we started both German and Latin simultaneously. Uh, and we went all the way through all the levels there and through that entire program we moved on to a different curriculum about uh, three or four years ago. So, um, German, let's say. German, they, they went through that entire world language program and then subsequently just through a few of the books that um, I have used myself, Asimil type books and uh, Berlitz uh, uh, self-teaching books, we did a little bit of work like that, but um, they have been able to read uh, increasingly lengthy and complex texts for many years. Um, we only spend, um, I, I think I could achieve a lot more, but they don't want to, and I'm not going to push them on this. Uh, we only spend about an hour a day on all of our language total. Um, we do uh, on alternate days uh, German and Latin, and then Spanish and Russian. And now Korean's been tacked on to, to all of that. Um, 
So uh, we've been spent about half an hour reading German, uh, and we have read stories, but uh, we've read various. Um, they were right now, uh, like encyclopedia type books, uh, factual books, and they're boys. They like reading comic book type things. So uh, we read a lot of things to stimulate their interest, uh, and their vocabulary and structural knowledge are, like I said, I think are, are, are very nicely uh, advanced. Uh, they don't really have any problem with understanding. We they read aloud and translate to, uh, so that I, into French, so that I make sure that you know they're understanding. And we leave that off when it's clear that uh, they they don't need to translate. And I just I'm right there to explain any words uh, that they don't know or if they just can't get the gist of the sentence to help them with that but um, I have no doubt that if they were to go to any uh, you know formally structured program school type thing they could place into the most advanced level of, of uh, learning the language and I think that if they had the opportunity to go and spend uh, you know a, a week or a month uh, in Germany or another German-speaking country they could a function immediately and really just sort of blossom and come alive. So uh, I'm very happy with that. Um, I think that, again that's due not just to the fact of, of what we did but the fact that I truly love the language and I'm just spending time with my boys whom I love with my language that I love and they just sort of gel together. Uh, Latin is pretty much the same. Uh, it's just a little I think it requires more time. So after we finish the, uh, the the Middlebury courses, we've done a whole bunch of other grammatical type uh, books. Uh, Familia Romana is the main one. Um, and again, we're, we're reading various things, uh, translating, uh, try to speak it uh, to the degree that we can. And so um, I'm quite happy with their, their Latin development as well. Like I said, I think it's a bit... Um, they need a bit more time with it to really get developed and I think again they, if they could have a, a total immersion experience in a living Latin program that would you know, they would just come alive immediately with that so um, I think that they can be judged to be advanced students of that language as well. So they've had about six, lang six years of both German and Latin. Uh, Spanish we just added maybe three, four years ago. Um, just because uh, they were curious to see what it was like and that made me happy when they wanted to, to see it and we actually did very little um, learning of it again I think we did go through a, a, a Anna Simeon manual and a Blitz manual and we've you know gone some verbal paradigms you know gone over the grammar but it's been mainly just plunging in and reading lots so uh, I can I think that Spanish, given that they are so strong in French and Latin, uh, is primarily due the ability to to get to a comparably advanced level in this language uh, is due mainly to that. Um, but it could also have something to do with that uh, early childhood exposure they had to it. And then uh, finally, there is Russian. Russian. Uh, we went to spent the summer in Saint Petersburg in 2016, and they got curious about it there. So uh, we have just stayed doing it ever since. We have uh, worked with a number of different uh, grammar books, uh, a bit here and there, some pattern drills, but mainly with uh, Asimil's Russian, which. Those of you who've been watching my videos for a long time know this is one of my all-time favorite courses. Um, we, aren't, we aren't making great progress. We've only still gotten about halfway through the book, but we've done a lot of start, stopping and starting and uh, repetition, and so I think that the overall result is that what they do know is, is quite solidly laid down as a foundation. So. Uh, as I said, uh, this has been achieved uh, without undue stress on uh, spending time on languages, but just by, uh, I think, sharing my love with my loves. So if you love your children and you love languages, I think that you should be able to do something similar. As I said, I've just launched into a lecture on my own today without having any chance to field any questions. I'm sure there will be some. So next week, uh, if you put in comments to this video, uh, things that you would like me to explain further or give more details about, I will make a follow-up question and answer video on the subject of raising multilingual children. Thank you.